astronomy, and the Bible. That's a very big area for a lot of people. One of the questions I will answer is how did that distant starlight reach this Earth if the universe is only 6,000 years old? I'll show you how to answer that question. So let's start. Astronomy and the Bible. Our roadmap through this one are going to be starting with the two models. What does the creation model teach? What does the evolution model teach about the history of the universe? Then we'll look at something called evidence for age. We'll just take a look at a couple evidences for age, because we're commonly taught the universe is about 13.7 billion years old now. That's the current uh, finding now. Then we'll take a look at origin of stars. Where did all these stars come from? Then we're going to look at scientific evidence and the Big Bang. We're going to compare the Big Bang against scientific evidence. Then we'll end with something called the Bible and Big Bang cosmology. Do they go together? So that's our roadmap. Let's start here. The two models. The evolution model and theistic evolution model. Now, theistic evolution model, we're talking about that group that talks about the day-age theory. The days of creation were long, indefinite periods of time. The gap theory, which puts billions of years of geologic time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, between those two verses. And I'm also going to put in there something called progressive creationism. Also, the days of creation were long and definite periods of time. So evolution and theistic evolution all believe in the Big Bang. They all believe the universe is 12 to 15 billion years old, and they all believe that stars evolved or formed by natural processes. God did not create them. Then there's the biblical model, which teaches God spoke the universe into existence. The universe is young, not billions of years old, and God created the stars. They did not evolve by natural processes. So we have a clear distinction between those models. Now, let's take a look at some of the implications of the Big Bang, Big Bang cosmology. It's associated with long ages and stars evolving into existence by natural processes. What does that mean to the Bible? Well, first of all, if you, once you put billions of years out there, it means the days of creation were not literal days. They were long ages. It also means God's very good includes billions of years of death and decay, if once you put billions of years in there. It also means there was death before sin. Also implies the Genesis flood was not a worldwide flood, and we're going to discuss that in the second talk in great detail. It also means Colossians 1.16, where God says he created all things, it doesn't mean all things. And it also means this. What did the heavens declare? The glory of God or evolved things by natural processes? There are tremendous implications to our biblical interpretation once we bring in Big Bang cosmology. So let's look at this. Evaluating the evidence. The textbooks and journals overwhelmingly state that the Big Bang is true. We have billions of years of universe history. And the stars took billions of years for that light to reach us. That is the Big Bang cosmology. That's what textbooks all talk about. But here's the question. Are we being given all the evidence? Or are they just giving selected information in the textbooks to protect evolution? We saw that yesterday in the Origin of Life. They're just giving selected information. Now, I have a question here. If any organization purposely hides information from its followers, what do you call that? That's a cult. That's exactly where evolution falls into, a cult. Now, what we're going to do here is test the accuracy of these models. We're going to look at more of the evidence, evidence that has been purposely censored out of the textbooks. And what we're going to find is evidence against one position is going to be support for the other. In other words, we find evidence this universe has, has to be billions of years old, then that will be evidence against the biblical model. But if we have evidence, scientific evidence, that this universe and Earth is young, then that is evidence against the evolution model, which we never see in our textbooks. So let's start here. Evidence number one, the recession of the moon. The Earth and moon are objects. They're masses. So the Earth is pulling on the moon, but the moon, being a mass, is also pulling on the Earth. And what we have is this gravity going back and forth. And we actually have the moon is receding from us. Uh-oh. Anybody worried about that? The moon is actually receding from us. Right where we sit today, it is receding from us. 
Anybody worried about the tithes? Well, let's see what we have here. That's according to Newton's third law of motion. It's actually receding from us at a rate of four centimeters a year. That bother anybody? No, not in our lifetime for sure. That's about a little under two inches a year. A little under two inches a year. But let's take a look at this two inches a year and let's go backwards in time and see what that does. If we were to go back about a thousand years, that means the moon is about 125 feet closer to us. No problem at all. Well, the moon is what, about 250,000 miles away from us, so what's 125 feet? That's going to be no effect at all, is it? No problem there. But if we go back a million years, now it's about 280, about 28.4 miles closer. Still insignificant in terms of tides and anything else. Go back a million. If we go back 10 million years, now it's 284 miles closer. But still, that's not very much compared to 250,000 miles. Now, how old is this solar system according to the evolutionists? About four and a half billion years. That's what they stick to, four and a half billion years. If we go back 100 million years, now we're 2,840 miles closer to us. Not much difference, not a lot of difference. We go back one billion years, we're 28,400 miles closer. Now we have some difference in the tides. But the way this works, it's not a linear progression back. Because if you go back 1.4 billion years, the moon's in contact with us. We have a major problem, or somebody has a major problem with the age of this Earth and Moon relationship now. 1.4 billion years, the Moon's in contact with us. That is evidence against a four and a half billion year old solar system here. And they haven't figured this one out yet. Now we know what happened to the dinosaurs. They got tired of drowning twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to another one. Comets. Now what's a comet? It's a big, dirty ice cube. That's what it is. It's got a small core, mostly big, dirty ice cube. Now, if this solar system is four and a half billion years old, there is a problem on the evolution story here. Because we take these comets, we divide them up into short period comets and long period comets. What's the difference? Well, short period comets are those comets that circle around our sun every 200 years or less. Long period comets are those ones that circle around our sun every 200 years or longer. Well, here's the situation. If this solar system is four and a half billion years old, all those big dirty ice cubes, those comets, should have been disintegrated. There should be no comets left. They should have all burned up a long time ago. Because every time they circle around our sun, what do they lose? Some of their mass. After so many times going around, they're all burned up. So what do we have? The evolution model postulates they are being replaced by something called the work cloud. That is the cloud that's supposed to be replacing the long period comets, 200 years or longer. Now, what do we know about this Oort cloud? Well, here's your definition. This Oort cloud is a ring of comets that circles way out there. So far out there, and get this story, so far out there, nobody can see it. Got that now? Isn't that called faith? What is the definition of faith? A belief without any observable evidence. That's faith. So, that's what they're doing. They're putting faith in the mouth. So far out there, nobody can see it. And every once in a while, one of these comets from that ring somehow comes in and starts circling around our solar system and our sun. Well, let's see what we know about it. There's some problems with the Oort cloud. One, it's never been observed. Secondly, there's no evidence that it exists. And third, there wouldn't be enough mass in this Oort cloud to exist for very long. There wouldn't be enough mass. According to the evolutionists, when the solar system was formed, there was a lot of collisions of these masses. There would have been so many collisions to form these planets, there wouldn't have been enough matter or material left to even form a ring of comets. So that's the third problem. Well, let's take a look what some scientists know. Don DeYoung, PhD in physics, wrote a book called Astronomy in the Bible. This is what he says. The existence of the Kuiper Belt, I'm going to talk about that one in just a moment, and the Oort cloud of comets has not been verified. Perhaps there is an alternative. The presence of comets may be evidence that the solar system is not as old as often assumed. Because there shouldn't be any of these comets out there going around our sun. Now, the Oort cloud is supposed to feed the long period comets. The Kuiper belt, which is out around Neptune area, is supposed to feed the short period comets, 200 years or less. And the same reason. Every once in a while, one of these ring of comets that circles around out in the Neptune area, that far out, comes in, starts going around our sun, circling around our sun in an elliptical format. Now, 
We've never seen your cloud. No evidence that it exists at all. But we have seen some Kuiper Belt objects. We have seen some of those. Kuiper Belt objects, KBOs, what we call them. Kuiper Belt, we have seen some. But that does not support the evolution model. See, what they will do is say, we have observed these things, but they won't give you the rest of the story. You see, here's the problem. The comets we see going around our sun in this elliptical orbit here, probably some of the biggest ones we find are about 10 kilometers in diameter. That's pretty big, 10 kilometers in diameter. But every object we see in this Kuiper belt is at least the minimum size is 100 kilometers up to 500 kilometers in diameter. Way too large. If we were to see something that was 100 kilometers in diameter going around by our Earth and around the sun, it would be a spectacular event. But we've never seen that. They're all far too large. Here's some more things about that. Kuiper Belt. S. Allen Stern, Sky and Telescope, makes this statement. The region simply doesn't possess anywhere near enough material for them to accumulate over the age of the solar system. In other words, there's not enough objects out there to have fed this solar system, this, they bring a comet, this comet's going around our sun for four and a half billion years. There's not enough objects out there to do that. There would have been at least a hundred times more objects needed at some point in time to have these comets continue going around our sun and elliptical orbit. So there's no verification of the Oort cloud and none of the Kuiper belt. But remember what they're going to teach you in your textbooks? We have a Kuiper belt, we've seen the objects, but they won't tell you what they really saw. They're all too large. Comets in the York Club. Timothy Ferris writes a book called The Whole Shebang, The State of the Universe Report. Now this book actually gets used as a textbook in some universities in the astronomy class. And he says this, Though the Oort cloud has yet to be observed, the theory accounts so well for the distribution of comets' orbits that most astronomers today accept its existence. In other words, they are accepting the Oort cloud's existence with no observable evidence. What is that called? An unquestioning belief that does not require proof or evidence. That's the definition of faith right out of the dictionary. But you know, evolution does not allow for faith. Found that out yesterday talking to a gentleman who's here. Did you want to have faith? Even though he gave you the definition for exactly. So we have to be careful. If we can't observe it, we have to be able to admit we have faith. I have faith. I have a bias. Everybody has a bias. I have a bias. Everybody else has a bias. Folks, if we can't observe it, we don't have any physical evidence, some point in time, we have to admit we have faith. We just have to admit that. There's nothing wrong with admitting you have faith. Maybe we'll find something out later. Maybe we won't. But we have to admit it at some point. Let's take a look at this. Comments in the Oort Cloud. Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort Cloud. Its properties, its origin, its evolution. Yet there is not a shred of direct observational evidence for existence. Who wrote this? Carl Sagan. One of those firm evolutionists. Here he's saying there's no evidence of it, but we're going to believe it. That is called faith. Doesn't matter how you try and worm out of it, it is faith. But evolution does not allow for faith. It's called a naturalistic model. Materialism. Therefore, they have absolutely no answer other than maybe the universe or solar system is not that old. Comments in the Oort Cloud. Danny Faulkner, PhD in astronomy, says this. Say, since it cannot be detected, the Oort Cloud is not a scientific concept. It is not bad science, but non-science masquerading as science. The existence of comets is good evidence that the solar system is only a few thousand years old. You see, when you look at the data, and you just look at the data, and interpret what the data says, it clearly supports it's not that old. But if you want to ignore the data and have a belief system, that's okay. <coughs> that's nothing wrong with having a belief system. But the data does not match the old solar system. Then we got the age of the sun. Now what does the sun do? Well, the, the belief is it does what it does through thermonuclear fusion. In other words, we have the hydrogen going to helium and on up to some other elements, eventually on up to iron. That's what's happening there, thermonuclear fusion. Now, the core of the sun, as it's going through all this thermonuclear fusion, will gradually grow brighter with age. That's what we believe about stars. That's the common theory about stars. As they grow older and older, they will grow brighter and brighter with this age. 
And we believe our sun, based on the evolutionist ideas of age, is about halfway through its lifetime. It's about four and a half billion years old, according to evolutionist dating ideas. And it should have a lifetime total of about 10 billion years. So we're about halfway through. Now, here's the problem. If the sun is four and a half billion years old, it should have brightened by about 40%. Since its very beginnings, when it first turned into a star, it should have brightened by about 40%. In other words, it's 40% brighter today than it was four and a half billion years ago. And if it's getting brighter with age, that means things are heating up. So let's take this back a little bit. The average temperature on this planet is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's going all the way back in time. It's been fairly consistent. There's been an, an ice age. There's been differences here and there. But if you take it back all these billions of years, the claim is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That's been about the average temperature through all these years. Now, we go back three and a half billion years, not four and a half, but three and a half billion years, that's when life is supposed to have originated. You go back three and a half billion years, that would put the sun about 25% less bright than it is today. It means it would be cooler. How much cooler? Well, it would put the average temperature on this planet below freezing. Now what is one of the things evolutionists requires for the origin of life? Heat. But the average temperature on this planet would be below freezing when the sun was 25% less bright than it is today. That is a problem for the evolution model that does not get discussed. Galaxy formation. Here's a couple of spiral galaxies. We have different types of galaxies. We have spiral galaxies, we have elliptical galaxies. But there's a problem with this. The measurements show that these elliptical galaxies, or the spiral galaxies, these long arms going around, as they're going around, rotating around these spiral gal or these galaxies here with these long arms, they should gradually lose their shape and turn into a great big blob. But there's a problem there. When the Hubble telescope looks out there and veers back into the universe there, they see some of these galaxies that still have their spiral shape. They should have lost that spiral shape a long time ago. They look identical to very close in galaxies, which are supposed to be some of the younger galaxies, according to the evolutionists. They should have lost their spiral shape. Good evidence that they're not that old. Galaxies, formation of galaxies. Joseph Silk, professor of astronomy at the University of Oxford, wrote a book called The Big Bang, writes this. Many aspects of the evolution of galaxies cannot yet be determined with any certainty. In other words, we don't have a clue how the galaxies form. We don't have a clue. We have a lot of guesses, but no real science that supports it. Galaxy formation, the facts on final dictionary strength. That's, you've got to trust this book because it's got the word facts in it. You've got to trust it. Let's see what they say. The facts on final dictionary. Galaxies must have condensed out of the gases expanding from the Big Bang. Details of the formation of galaxies are still highly uncertain, as is their subsequent evolution. Notice those words, must have. That's not science at all. But you know, I see this in the biology textbooks, must have, could have, we think, we believe. Why in the world should evolution have to use those kind of statements? Maybe because they don't have any scientific evidence. So they're trying to force a belief on people. Folks, we need to keep science at the science classroom. Don't say words like must have. Why don't you just say, we don't know, and be honest about it. But then, notice they say must have condensed. But let's look and see what they have to say. Because doesn't that sound like a lot of faith there? Why is there must have any more scientific than in the beginning God created? Why is it? It isn't. There's no justification for putting a statement like that in a textbook and calling it science and not allowing in the beginning God created in the textbooks. Other than textbook writers have a personal belief and they want everybody else to have that belief too. See, it's not science what you have to use words like that. Evidences of a young universe, recession of the moon, comets, age of the sun, galaxy formation are all strong evidences that go against the evolution model. All of these are kept from the textbooks. So let's go to this one now, Origin of Stars. This is an important one here, Origin of Stars. And what I want to do when I get done this Origin of Stars, I'm going to show you how to answer the question, how that distant starlight get here. 
I have about four different ways to answer, but I'm going to show you the easiest way to answer. And again, on this whole arch and stars, are we being given all the information? Or are we just being taught selected information? Well, let's take a look at the origin of stars. The evolution model says stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. The instinct evolution model states what? Stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. Not a lot of difference there, is there? The biblical model says God created the Earth on day one, and on day four he made the stars. There's a big difference now, isn't there? Big difference between theistic evolution and the Bible, and the big difference between evolution and the Bible. Well, let's take a look at the origin of stars. Hugh Ross, who is an astronomer, one of the leaders of the progressive creationist movements, a theistic evolution type model here, this is what he has to say. The entire process of stellar evolution is by natural processes alone. We do not have to invoke divine intervention at any stage in the history of the life cycle of the stars that we observe. Now what is he saying here? At no stage do we have to invoke God. It can all happen by natural processes. And this man and progressive creationist movement says that is a literal interpretation of the Bible. Well, let's see. Does that statement agree with God's word? Well, let's take a look what the Bible has to say. Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. That settles it right there, doesn't it? That should settle it right there, but it doesn't for some of these people. They want to believe the evolutionist model because they want to be friends with the world. Let's see some more here. Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath great these things that bringeth out their host by number. And there's more. <coughs> Psalm 8, 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. And we have more. Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth to see and all this in them. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them. Psalm 148, 5, for he commanded, and they were created. Isaiah 45, 12, I even my hands have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. Nehemiah 9, 6, thou, even thou, our Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, and all their hosts. Are we seeing a pattern here? All things were made by him, right out of the Gospels. For thou hast created all things, and by pleasure they are and were created. Revelation. It's kind of a theme throughout the whole book, isn't it? So, here's the question. Is stellar formation by natural processes compatible with Scripture? I don't believe so. I think it is by the word of the Lord that the stars were made. Well, let's take a look at this a little bit more here. That's what the Bible teaches. But does that agree with observable science? See, we have to be fair on this side now. The Bible says one thing. And if we're going to say the Bible is true, the science should support it. But that's not what we read in the books. So let's take a look at this. The popular theory for how stars form is we get these nebulae, these gas and dust clouds, rotating around out there, and they begin to gravitationally collapse in, form a protostar, then over time they form into a star. Now is that true? No, it's not. Just because it's in the textbook doesn't make it true. Piltdown Man was in the textbooks for 40 years. It wasn't true. Nebraska Man was in the textbooks. Vestigial organs were in the textbooks. They weren't true. Many other things are in textbooks that are not true. Even history books, they're not true. Why is it this true then? Well, when you get a nebula out there rotating around, this gas and dust cloud, as it rotates around, it will begin to gravitationally collapse inward. But as it begins to gravitationally collapse inward, it generates heat pressure. And that heat pressure causes that cloud to re-expand. It is theoretically possible for it to gravitationally collapse and form a star. But it has to be very, very condensed. And we don't observe any gas and dust clouds doing that. Let's take a look at what some of the astronomers have to say. So gas and dust clouds will expand, not contract. You can go to your physics 101 book, read the gas pressures, and right there you'll see, you can do it mathematically, that it will cause that gas and dust cloud to expand. Let's see what they have to say. Don Youngen, PhD in physics, says this. The complete birth of a star has never been observed. The principles of physics demand some special conditions 
for star formation and also for a long time period. A cloud of hydrogen gas must be compressed to a sufficiently small size so that gravity dominates. And he concludes, in space, however, almost every gas cloud is light years in size, hundreds of times greater than the critical size needed for a stable start. As a result, outward gas pressure cause these clouds to spread out farther, not contract. Wow. Let's look at some more of that. Fred Whipple, The Mysteries of Comets, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian Institute Press, 1985. Now, I can use this as an old quote, 1985, but nothing has changed in star formation over the last 25 years. And this is what he has to say. Precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. Wow. There's your Smithsonian Institute. Are they a Christian organization? Not hardly. Let's look at another one. Danny Faulkner has his PhD in astronomy, says, To many astronomers it seems reasonable that stars could form from these clouds of gas. Most astronomers believe that the clouds gradually contract under their own weight to form stars. This process has never been observed. But if it did occur, it would take many human lifetimes. We're talking about 100,000 years or more. So anybody that said they've seen a star form is really old. <laughs> and then he concludes, It is known that clouds do not spontaneously collapse to form stars. The clouds possess considerable mass, but they are so large that their gravity is very feeble. Any decrease in size would be met by an increase in gas pressure that would cause a cloud to re-expand. <clears throat> Let's see more, just to make sure. Uh, Hans Alvin, Nobel Prize winner from NASA, says this. There is general belief that stars are forming by gravitational collapse. In spite of vigorous efforts, no one has yet found any observational indication of confirmation. Thus, the generally accepted theory of stellar formation may be one of a hundred unsupported dogmas which constitute a large part of present-day astrophysics. Are we seeing enough of this here? Getting the clue here? Right, let's do another one. Charles Lyon and Frank Shute, both astronomers. Let's see what they have to say. Despite numerous efforts, we have yet to directly observe the process of stellar formation. The origin of stars represents one of the fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. I think we got the pattern. But we've got to go to our facts on file dictionary, don't we, to get the real scoop here. <laughs> Let's get the real scoop. Here's what they say. Stars are formed by the gravitational collapse of cool, dense gas and dust clouds. Whoa. That's what they're saying. But you know, sometimes you have to read the rest of the story. If that's where you stop, you might believe this. But let's see what they also say in this book. They go on. There are problems, however, in initiating the collapse of a gas cloud. It resists collapse because of, firstly, its internal motions and the heating effects of nearby stars. Secondly, the centrifugal support due to rotation. Thirdly, the magnetic field pressure. And finally, they say, in a massive, dense cloud shielded by dust, it is believed that collapse can be triggered when the cloud is slowed on passing through the spiral density wave pattern of our galaxy. Notice that word believed. Why do they have to use a word like that? Because they have no evidence. Why is that more scientific than in the beginning God created? See, we are allowing one religion in the classroom and not another. If we're going to let one religion in, we should allow them all, folks. But we're not, because evolution turns out to be a very protected religion in this country. Well, wait, uh-oh, here we go. Star nurseries. Everybody remember this one, the Eagle Nebula. It's all over the place. It's in the textbooks. Does this picture show stars forming? According to the textbooks, it does. But you see, we need to get the rest of the story again. There's a lot of deception going on here. If we're going to teach science, we need to teach all the science so we can start thinking like scientists. See, many teachers out there, many people, scientists, have been indoctrinated into thinking like this, and when they need to be retrained to start thinking like scientists. We've got to get people starting thinking like scientists. Go through the scientific model. Start understanding that. Don't reject it. Start looking at all the evidence. When dark nebula, here's what happens. When these dark nebula, these gas and dust clouds, when they collide with an emission nebula, very bright, hot nebula, they will collide and form these great big fingers to stick up like here, and you see in the Eagle Nebula. But here's one of the big problems. Those bright spots have been measured at about 10,000 Kelvin. That is so hot, they could not condense. They're going to expand. Now, where does that come from? That actually comes from 
series of astronomers on that. A series of astronomers have made have confirmed that. These are so hot. Then there's the other thing. Well, we see there were no bright spots there, then we saw some bright spots. That's because the gas and dust cloud is spreading out, and now we can see behind it. See, they don't tell us that. They disallow anything that goes against their model. Just look at this piece of evidence and don't look at this. Folks, if you're going to think scientifically, you've got to look at this piece of evidence, and you've got to look at this piece of evidence. Also, you can't rule it out, because once you do, you're no longer scientific. You become a faith. Well, let's look at another one, Star Nurseries. Martin Rees, a leading researcher on cosmic evolution, leading researcher in this area, in his book, Before the Beginning, 1998. Stars are still forming today. About 1,500 light years away lies the Orion Nebula, enough gas and dust to make millions of stars. It even contains protostars that are still condensing. Watch this, though. Last year, images taken by the European Southern Observatory with a very large telescope in January 2002 of the Horsehead Nebula in Orion verified the structures are expanding. Now, what do we think about that gentleman's conclusion in 1998? He was completely wrong, wasn't he? Because he was thinking this way and not like a scientist when it comes to this issue. I'm not saying these people aren't smart, folks. They are heads and tails above me in intelligence. But you can, be, you can have all the great work and all the intelligence, but if you start with the wrong assumption, your conclusion will be wrong, too. And that's what's happening. Star formation in time. I, I like numbers. Most of you probably know by now, I like numbers. This is the number of galaxies that the astrophysicists calculate in the universe. About 100 billion galaxies, scientific notation 10 to the 11th. They also say that the average galaxy has about 200 billion stars in it, two times 10 to the 11th. I want to see if their numbers add up here. Let's give them an age in the universe 20 billion years. They're, they're saying now about 13.7. So we're going to give them 20 billion years, give them a little extra time here. If you take 100 billion galaxies, multiply that by 200 billion stars, divide that by 20 billion years, that means 1 trillion stars are forming every year for 20 billion years. Whoa. That's a lot of stars forming this year. I know the universe is big. A trillion stars every year. Let's bring those numbers down a little bit. That calculates out to 2.7 billion stars per day. In other words, today 2.7 billion stars must have formed. Let's bring it down a little bit more. That's 31,700 stars forming every second for 20 billion years, folks, and we can't even see one. <laughs> the numbers don't add up. See, when you put the science behind it and match it up, it just doesn't work. You know what the explanation is now? During the early <coughs> stages of the universe is when most of the stars form. Folks, that's nothing more than faith. That's hiding your evidence. That's hiding everything. And now, some of the evolutionists, in order to fix this big bang model, or now, the evolutionists are saying this now, that in the early stages of the universe, in the very beginnings of the universe, light was much faster. And it slowed down to a constant. What? <laughs> Wait a minute. We're just making things up as we go along. Folks, why can't we just keep it to science, what we can observe? Quit making up data and then forcing our students to learn this stuff. That's not right. We need to keep it to science. If we don't know, just be honest about it and say, we don't know. Let's look at some more. Textbooks, are they correct? Prentice Hall, Earth Science, 2001. A nebula is a large amount of gas and dust spread out in immense volume. All stars begin their lives as part of nebula. Gravity can pull some of the gas and dust in the nebula together. Their energy cloud is then called a protostar. A star is born when the contracting gas and dust becomes so hot that nuclear fusion starts. Is that true? Absolutely not, folks. What in the world are we teaching our students? Not science. This statement is not based on science at all. It is based on nothing more than a belief in evolution. We need to get back to teaching science. That is called deception by omission. By omitting the science, they are deceiving our students, deliberately deceiving. So, conclusion of star formation. Marcus Chow, Let There Be Light, 1998. The truth is, we don't understand star formation at the fundamental level. That's it, right there. We don't. Why can't we just say that in our textbooks? Because, folks, when it comes to evolution, the evidence doesn't matter. All that matters 
is our students go out of there believing in evolution. But you know, all the indoctrination they're getting in schools, a majority of students are coming out of there not believing evolution. Isn't that amazing? That's all they get in schools is indoctrination with evolution, and they still don't believe it, many of them. Why? Because it does not make scientific sense. That's why. They can't present the observable evidence. Why believe in something if you can't get the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith, and I'll tell you about mine. That's what it comes down to. Now, if this universe is billions of years old, how did that distance star light get here? Let me answer that question. Here's the best way to answer it. There's a scientific way using gravity and time. We have a, I have a book, one of my own books back there. You can read through that if you want. The first chapters are okay. Then he gets into all his mathematical equations if you like those things. I do. Here's how you answer that question. When somebody says, how did that distance star light get here? This is your response. I will tell you how that light got here if you will tell me where the first star came from. No stars, no light. Let's talk about something else now. That's it right there. No scientist on this planet can state how that first star got here other than a faith-based condition. We're on a level playing field now. I don't have to worry about the light if you can't tell me where the star came from. Tell me where all these trains of stars came from. I need the observable evidence. If you can't give me the observable evidence how 31,700 stars formed every second for 20 billion years, folks, then you're, accept, you're asking me to accept your model by faith. I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith, and I'll tell you about my faith. That's where it comes. That's where it goes. It doesn't take long to break down the science argument and get to the real condition. See, it's not about this. It's not an intellectual battle at all. It's here, folks. Some people have willfully rejected Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. Our job is simply to go out and give them the truth. If they don't want to accept it, that's fine. We don't want to attack somebody else's faith. We don't want anybody attacking our faith. People have the right to have their own faith. But we should be letting them know the truth. Let people know the truth. So question, why do so many textbooks state we know how stars form? Well, it goes back to the statement. Evidence doesn't matter. All that matters is we believe in evolution. So let's go to the next part. Scientific evidence in the Big Bang. Now, is, are we being told all the evidence again? It seems that the Big Bang is almost a fact based on what I read in textbooks. Well, let's look at the evidence. Evidence of the Big Bang. Here's some of your popular evidences for the Big Bang. The red shift of starlight, cosmic background radiation, element abundance, education system, and the medium. That's some of their best evidence right there, education system and the media. But let me show you the evidences that contradict the Big Bang. Redshift to starlight, cosmic background radiation, galaxy formation, spiral galaxies, supernova remnants, distribution of galaxies, first and second laws of thermodynamics, medium heavy elements, star formation. Wow. And we can go on and on there too. Did you know about 90% of the universe is missing? Anybody here take it? kind of cold, cold, dark matter. 90% of it is missing. We can't find it. It's just not the matter we can see out there. See, as a creationist, we can take it or leave it, but the evolutionists have to have it for their model. So they're looking desperately for this dark matter. Well, I'm going to take a look at just one of these pieces here. We're going to look at just one of them. And I'm going to start with the Big Bang. What do we know about the Big Bang? What is this Big Bang? Well, here's your handy space answer book, 1998. 15 to 20 billion years ago, a Big Bang or explosion occurred creating the universe. The universe began as an infinitely dense hot fireball scrambling in space and time. Now don't get the idea the Big Bang is like a dynamite explosion. That's not the picture we have. The Big Bang is a hot fireball. It's an expansion of space and time. That's what it is. It's an expansion, a hot fireball expansion of space and time. It is not like a dynamite explosion. So we need to forget about that. Get that picture out of your mind. That's not it. So space and time is expanding. And there's some critical things this is going to be built on. The Big Bang model, expansion in space and time. Here's what we're saying. Here's our original matter. Where did that come from? It's a pretty good question. It is a legitimate question, too. And it gets ignored. Why? Because the evolutionists don't have an answer. Folks, if you don't have an answer, just say you don't have an answer. Don't ignore it. You're not being scientific then. Here's your original matter. And here's what happens. Space and time expands out, and then what we have is a universe with no center. 
That is critical to the Big Bang model. A universe with no center. Not many people ever read that, but that's part of the Big Bang model. It's kind of like, I'll give you a, a rough analogy. you got a balloon. You blow it up. You have all these dots on it, and as you blow it up, everything expands. And where are all the dots? They're on the skin or edge of that balloon. That is the universe. What's in the middle? We don't know. According to the evolutionists, there's nothing there. That's the model. And that is critical. Now, does this sudden introduction of matter and expansion sound something like a miracle? Well, let's see what Paul Davies has to say about it. He's a physicist and an evolutionist. In his book, The Edge of Infinity, he describes the Big Bang this way. The Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. The sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allows something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. Whoa. That's exactly what it is. The evolution model clearly relies on miracles here. Where did the matter come from? What caused it to expand? Because you know every effect has to have a cause. And there is no explanation for that. So it's being taught on a faith-based issue. So why is that any more scientific than, than in the beginning God created? Because there is no physical evidence where the matter came from, nor what caused it to expand. No evidence whatsoever. Will we find it? No, you won't. Because it's an historical thing. can't be repeated. Well, let's go a little further. Big Bang. Richard Goat, PhD in astrophysics. Implications of the Copernican principle. Anybody remember Copernicus? Did he preach heresy in his day? What did he say? The earth is not the center of the universe. And everybody got on top of him for that. But you know, that is part of the Big Bang model now. Two key things to understanding the Big Bang. One, it has no center. And secondly, it's homogeneous. Meaning regardless of where you are in this universe, it's going to look the same everywhere. There is no special place in this universe. That is critical to the Big Bang. Here's what he says. The idea that we are not located in a special spatial location has been crucial in cosmology, leading directly to the Big Bang Theory. So two things. No center, no special place. Means no matter where you're located in the universe, look out there, it will always look the same. Well, let's look at some of that. And I want to use this one, the redshift of starlight. That is popularly used as strong evidence for the Big Bang, that the universe is expanding. Now, redshift, light spectrum. Let me give you an analogy of what we're talking about. We've probably heard of something called the Doppler, Doppler effect. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here, redshift to starlight. Because we have our light spectrum here. We have the ultraviolet one side, the blue side. We have the infrared, the red side, red and blue sides here. Now, let me give you, let's say a car was approaching you, and its horn is on all the time. As that car approaches you, what happens to the sound, the pitch of the sound? It gets higher and higher, doesn't it? Why? Because the sound waves are being compressed as it's nearing you. But once that car goes by you and is going away from you, what happens to the pitch of the sound? It gets lower and lower because the sound waves are being stretched out. The same thing applies to light. If a light source is moving towards you, you will see it show up on the blue side of the light spectrum. It's not blue light. We're not talking about blue light or red light. Just the elements will come down onto the blue side. But if a light source is moving away from you, it will show up on the red side of the light spectrum because the light waves are being stretched. Almost everything we observe in this universe is redshifted, which gives a very strong indication of a big bang back in history and everything is expanding. That's what we get in the textbooks. So light source moving towards you, compressed. Light source moving away from you, stretched, red side. <coughs> Redshifts are used to describe the expansion of the universe, the distance of a galaxy from the Earth due to the stretching of the light waves. That's what's in the textbooks. That sounds pretty good. Very convincing. Redshift interpretation. Let me give you an example here. If we saw a galaxy at this distance, it might show up on this side of the redshift. If we saw a galaxy further away, it would show up further to the right on the redshift. If we saw a third galaxy that was even further away, it would show up further on the red side. So that's what we're saying here. It's a measure of the distance of these galaxies. Now, if Evolution is true. Remember, their model is based on what? Homogeneous, homogeneous universe. Everywhere we look, it should be the same. We should find these redshifts all up and down that light spectrum. All up and down. In other words, this is kind of what we should see. 
Redshift's all up and down that, that light spectrum. Everywhere we look, we should find galaxies on that redshift line, all up and down. But the fact, notice, the fact is that is not what we observe. What we observe is this. Those redshifts are coming in distinct quanta, distinct distances, at one million light year distances. In other words, we see a redshift at 1 million light years. We see another redshift at 2 million light years, another one at 3, and another one at 4, but we don't find anything in between there. They're coming what we call distinct quanta. And we look out there and we see these concentric circles around us. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here. There's our galaxy. That's the best PowerPoint can do there. There's our Milky Way. We look out there and we see a concentric circle of redshift at 1 million light years. We look out a little further. We see another concentric circle around us of redshifts at 2 million light years. We look out a little bit further. We see a redshift concentric circle around us at 3 million light years. Has this been confirmed? Because it's going to have a very important part in this cosmology and the Big Bang. Has it been confirmed? Well, here's a couple of uh, astrophysicists in their astrophysical journal. Back in 1984, almost 20 years ago, this is what they said. There is now firm evidence that redshifts of galaxies are quantized. Meaning we have them in these concentric circles around us. However, back in 1984, most people did not want to believe this. That can't be true. Well, here's some astrophysicists that said it is. They've observed this. But the world said, no, we're not going to bother with that. Well, let's see a little further. Redshift. Russell Humphreys, PhD in physics and technical journal. I have his book back there, Starlight and Time. Incidentally, he is an award-winning physicist. Astronomers have confirmed that numerical values of galaxies' redshifts are quantized, tending to fall into distinct groups. That would mean the galaxies tend to be grouped in conceptual spherical shells concentric around our home galaxy. This is going to have great repercussions here. Let's look a little more here. Confirmation by the Hubble. Here's a 1997 Journal of Astrophysics and Astronomy. The redshift distribution has been found to be strongly quantized in the galactic concentric frame of reference. The phenomena is easily seen by eye and apparently cannot be ascribed to statistical artifacts, selection procedures, or flawed reduction techniques. In other words, what he's saying there, it has been observed. So well observed, the Hubble telescope has confirmed this out beyond a billion light years now. Wow. What does all this mean? What does it mean to the Big Bang? Well, Russell Humphreys puts it together here in his book, Starlight and Time. The quantized distribution of the galactic redshifts observed by various astronomers seems to contradict the Copernican principle and all cosmologies founded on it, including the Big Bang. In other words, the only way, the only explanation we have for why we can see concentric circles around us in the redshifts is that our galaxy has to be within one million light years of the center of the universe. I'm not talking geocentricity now, where the Earth is the exact center. We're talking galactic centricity, where our galaxy is near the center, could be moving, but it is near the center. The observable data supports that today. And this was founded by the evolutionist astronomers almost 20 years ago, and it has been confirmed by the Hubble telescope. What does that mean to the Big Bang? What did the Big Bang say? There is no center. And there's homogeneous, homogeneous universe. Well, it is not homogeneous, and there is a center, based on the observed data. Isn't this great? Did anybody see this in the news? No, it is being, they're doing their best to hide this information. I've got a lot of astronomy books at home, not one of them mentions this yet. Implications. Halt and Arc. Now he is a very big evolutionist astronomer. Extremely good astronomer. When he did make some of these discoveries, they ostracized this man. In other words, if you go against the norm, they don't want to have you. That's not called science. Science is based on looking at all areas here. You see, if you go against evolution, they don't want you anymore. Here's what he has to say. The fact that measured values of redshift do not vary continuously but come in steps, certain preferred step values, is so unexpected that conventional astronomy has never been able to accept it, in spite of the overwhelming observational evidence. But what do we know about evolution? Evidence doesn't matter. 
All that matters is you believe. And if anything goes against your model, get rid of it. That's what we're saying in the evolution model. But that's not science. We need to get back to thinking like scientists and acting like scientists, not forcing ideas. Implication, quantized redshifts, summary of evidence is what have we seen here. Evidence appears to purport the Big Bang only when contradictions are ignored. That's called our textbooks. The Big Bang model is constantly changing to match the data. The Big Bang model cannot explain much of the observed data. In other words, are the evidences for the Big Bang good enough to warrant billions of years of time now? Not at all. Because the observable data does not match Big Bang cosmology. So let's go down to the last part now. The Bible and Big Bang cosmology. Can we combine them? Well, the Bible and time of creation. Here are 12 biblical evidences why a day is a literal day. Now, I'm going to go through these in detail, some of them, in the next talk. Twelve biblical evidences why a day is a day. Then we have something that's nothing too difficult for God. Jeremiah 32, 7, he tells us that. You know, 17 places in the Bible, 17 places in the Bible, it teaches that God stretched the heavens out. What that means, I don't know. I wasn't there. But God could have just taken everything and just stretched it out. That's how that light got here. Because he's God. We're not. We also have a God of miracles. God created trees mature with fruit. He created mature animals. Created Adam and Eve mature. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus turned water into wine. Withered the fig tree instantly. Instant learning a language. Tower of Babel. Instant healing the soldier's ear when Peter tried to chop it off. And he has a very good creation. We've got a God that can do all this. So do we have to bring God down to our level? No. Genesis, the Big Bang, Danny Faulkner, Ph.D. Astronomy writes this. There are many today who interpret Genesis in terms of the latest scientific theories and even fads. That's like the Big Bang. If the history of science is any teacher, then we must conclude that many of these ideas eventually will be discarded. And he says, if we have staked out a position that Genesis teaches these ideas, then what is to become of Genesis when these are abandoned? A great concern of mine is that many Christians to have wedded the creation account of the Bible to the Big Bang theory. The Big Bang, folks, is in big scientific trouble. It is being kept alive by the media and textbooks only. John Bile, who also happens to have a PhD in astronomy, and actually heads up the mathematics department at the college he's at, says this. First, Big Bang cosmology, even though it is currently by far the most popular cosmology, and even though it is represented, presented as undoubtedly true, is beset with a number of serious, get this, observational and theoretical difficulties. And then we have Dr. Werner Gitt, PhD in physics. It is a great pity that many Christians are willing to reinterpret the infallible word of God to fit a fallible man-made theory like the Big Bang. Such ideas are ultimately devised to counter the biblical record, which is firmly against cosmic evolution over billions of years. Those who urge trying to harmonize the Big Bang with Scripture find it only natural to go to other evolutionary ideas, such as a primitive earth, gradually cooling down, death and struggle millions of years before the fall, and so on. And that is exactly what we see happening in churches today. Once you bring in one part of it, it's so much easier to bring in the rest of it. So, scientists, just make sure you understand, there are many scientists that believe in a six-day creation about 6,000 years ago. Now, why do these people believe it? Are they dumb? Are they ignorant of science? No. Folks, where did they get their degrees? From the evolution schools. Who gave them their degrees? The evolutionists. So, they're dumb. What do we say about the professors then? See, it doesn't work very well, does it? These are very smart people. They believe this for two reasons. One, they believe God's word. And they can also support what I've said today, a young earth, scientifically. These are very smart people. So the pattern of evolution, we've seen a pattern of evolution, not interpreting all the evidence, not reporting all the evidence, constantly updating the Big Bang model to match observed data. Disagreement among astronomers, a disregard for biblical interpretation, and appeal to churches to accept real science. You can have evolution in the Bible. No, you cannot. You cannot have evolution in the Bible. That's going to be our next talk. Evolution. Can you combine evolution in the Bible? 
So, which is easier to believe? Nothing created something? That's the evolution model right there. Nothing created something. That If you're believing in evolution, that is what you're believing. Or God used evolution, or in the beginning, God created. He spoke it into existence. Those are your three choices. And finally, here's an abstract from Los Alamos paper. Moreover, there are some questions that scientists still do not know how to ask, let alone answer scientifically. Was there anything before the Big Bang? Is there a role for life in the cosmos? Why is there something rather than nothing? Will we ever know? You see, if you're believing in evolution, you don't have any answers to these. You have no answers. So what happens? They get ignored. They just get ignored. But see, if you're going to take the biblical model, we have answers. There is meaning to life, and there's meaning to this universe. If you're believing in evolution, you have no meaning to life, you have no meaning to this universe, you can't even answer those basic questions. But you believe God's word, you have answers.